In the past two weeks, Bangladesh's police force has shot and killed student protesters on the streets. They have run over students with their cars. Riot police are deployed, even Bangladesh special forces and the army have been mobilized. It's like an anti-terror operation. Special forces are landing on the roof of a Dhaka University building via helicopter. The Sheikh Hasina government appears to have declared war against its own youth. How many more tales of barbarity will there be, we don't know because we still haven't gotten the full story yet. It is being said that one of the worst episodes of slaughter in the history of Bangladesh is unfolding, with over 160 people officially dead. Thousands have been injured. And this figure is completely incomplete because we lack information. During the recording of this episode, there is a curfew throughout Bangladesh and a complete internet blackout. Because of this, many videos, accounts and barbarities have yet to come out. Another dark chapter is being written in Bangladesh's history. This time, the dictator Sheikh Hasina is facing the strength of the students. Perhaps even this dictator had to yield. In today's episode, we will understand what is going on in Bangladesh. Why is there so much fire? What is this controversial quota system in Bangladesh? Why is there opposition to it? And finally, why has Sheikh Hasina adopted such dictatorial and brutal conduct against a simple protest by students in their own country? Despite all this, how did the students defeat her? But still, she insists that her fight, her war, is not over. Let's find out why. Before addressing the violence of the last few days, it is necessary to understand the history behind it. A little history lesson is necessary here. Bangladesh became independent from Pakistan in 1971. Pakistan, with America's support, had committed genocide against Bengalis, reportedly killing more than 3 million people. Many in Bangladesh raised their voices against the Pakistani army, took up arms, and eventually, Bangladesh emerged victorious. The Pakistani military had to withdraw. Pakistan was divided in 1971, and Bangladesh gained independence. The Awami League was the main party that played a significant role in the freedom struggle. Sheikh Mujibar Rahman became Bangladesh's Prime Minister in 1972. He introduced the Freedom Fighter Quota, and subsequent governments continued this reservation. Because it is an emotional matter, the reservation quota is considered on the basis of social justice. They kept expanding it, but many students protested against this quota system in 2018. Their argument was that the quota based on social justice is understandable when there is a need. But the 30% quota reserved for Freedom Fighters' progeny should be immediately removed, because it doesn't make any logical sense. Perhaps it sounds good to hear? But in reality, Sheikh Hasina was using it to favor her favorite people by giving them jobs within the government, deceiving the youth of Bangladesh in the name of this reservation. The students' first argument was that honoring freedom fighters through quotas was justified initially. For the first 10 years, maybe 20, but extending it to their descendants for generations after generations makes no sense. They pointed out that the constitution intended to grant quotas solely to actual freedom fighters, not their progeny, as it lacked legal basis and did not address economic or social backwardness. During the liberation war in Bangladesh, almost the entire country was involved. Everyone contributed in different ways. In this case, who will decide who is the child of a freedom fighter and who is not? How is the quota system being misused nowadays? We have seen that in India in the UPSC scam, and in Bangladesh too. The most surprising thing is that currently, in Bangladesh, only 0.13% of the population is officially recognized as descendants of freedom fighters. That is, only 0.13% of the population enjoys a 30% reservation for being a freedom fighter's descendant. This is a serious issue. There is no controversy here. This does not make any sense. It is clear to the students. However, Sheikh Hasina has been accused of issuing fake certificates of freedom fighters to her favorites, so that they could become a civil servant, a carter within the government. After that, the entire system will be in her clutch. I mean, how can you betray her when she is the one who gave you the job in the first place? Over the last few days, an attempt has been made to compare the quota system of Bangladesh with that of India, arguing that if it's bad there, it's bad here too. However, there is a significant difference between the systems of India and Bangladesh, especially regarding the 30% freedom fighter reservation quota. In India, reservation is implemented based on caste for social justice, according to the population and studies of social backwardness. A reservation system is created to provide SC, street and OBC communities with government jobs and education reservations to reduce historical disadvantages and discrimination to some extent. There is no debate on this, and it has been shown how this reservation is being misused in our country country, especially visible in the UPSC cadre. In Bangladesh, until 2018, 
there is a 56% reservation, including 10% for women, 10% for underdeveloped districts, 5% for ethnic minorities, and 1% for people with disabilities and transgender people, totaling 26%. This logic somewhat aligns with India's system. However, the root of the entire problem is the 30% quota for freedom fighters and their descendants, which has generated the most anger. The anger is not against the entire reservation system, but specifically this 30%. In 2018, the Bangladesh High Court heard a petition challenging the legality of this quota system. On March 8, 2018, the High Court rejected the petition, leading to student protests claiming their voices weren't heard, and demanding reforms in the quota system. Note, students demanded a reform in the quota system, not complete abolition. However, Sheikh Hasina responded to the protests by abolishing the entire quota system through an executive order. Various committees were formed for discussions, and the order was implemented in 2020, removing the quota system. Great. However, here comes the sly game of politics. An appeal was filed with the Bangladesh High Commission challenging Sheikh Hasina's executive order as illegal. On June 5, 2024, the Bangladesh High Court reversed Sheikh Hasina's executive order, reinstating the quota system. Students expressed anger again, stating that if Sheikh Hasina could abolish the quota system in 2018 with an executive order, she could have reformed the quota system by considering students' demands or passed a bill if she was serious about the matter. Instead, her government appealed to the Supreme Court's appellate division. Students knew very well that Sheikh Hasina is deliberately dragging the issue and trying to reintroduce the 30% freedom fighter quota. Now, why there's a lack of trust in Sheikh Hasina? This could be a subject for a long episode. When almost a month passed without any action from Sheikh Hasina on quota reforms, the protests began. It's important to note that students weren't protesting whimsically. They demanded reforms based on population and social justice. One might wonder why students are protesting against Sheikh Hasina when it was the High Court's order to reinstate the quota. The answer lies in the belief that everything from the police to the Supreme Court operates under Sheikh Hasina's directives in Bangladesh, illustrating the dictatorial rule there. In January 24, Sheikh Hasina achieved a historic victory in the Bangladesh elections, but it wasn't a true election as only her party contested, and the opposition didn't participate. Transparency International, a global anti-corruption organization, stated that the Bangladesh elections were one-sided and fraudulent. The Election Commission, Judiciary, and government actions favored Sheikh Hasina, with opposition leaders being convicted and independent media suppressed. Even Nobel laureates? Muhammad Yunus faced numerous cases from Sheikh Hasina's government despite his contributions to Bangladesh's economic miracle through microfinancing. In the 2024 elections, main opposition parties boycotted, demanding an independent election commission and caretaker government. Sheikh Hasina proceeded without opposition, highlighting her dictatorial control over every institution in Bangladesh. On June 5, 2024, the Bangladesh High Court reversed Sheikh Hasina's executive order, reinstating the quota system. Students expressed their dissatisfaction, noting that in 2018, Sheikh Hasina had abolished the entire quota system with one stroke. So she could also bring a reformed quota system through an executive order, or could have passed a bill if she was serious about the matter. However, Sheikh Hasina did not do this. Instead, her government filed an appeal in the appellate division of the Bangladesh Supreme Court. Students believe that Sheikh Hasina was deliberately delaying the matter and pushing an agenda to reintroduce the 30% freedom fighter quota. The mistrust in Sheikh Hasina could be a topic for a long episode, focusing on her authoritarianism. The point is, when nearly a month passed without any action on quota reform, protests began. On July 1st, the student protests intensified, and Sheikh Hasina deployed her dictatorial toolkit. Initially, students were placated by stating the matter was pending in the Supreme Court and urged not to protest. Accusations followed that opposition parties were misleading the students and using them as political tools, but this was not true since the student movement was largely decentralized without specific central political leadership and control. Students started with sit-ins at universities, and on July 7th, protesters began nationwide blockades, initiating road and rail block programs in major cities. The movement was large-scale but peaceful. Students believed they had no other choice. Under this pressure, the Supreme Court's appellate bench stayed the controversial High Court judgment, and on August 7th, after a significant delay, the Supreme Court announced a hearing. Sheikh Hasina told the students to stop protesting as the hearing was imminent, but students had no faith in her, given her past actions. Protests continued, and on July 14th, Sheikh Hasina declared the students as anti-national in a press conference, stating that if not for the grandchildren of freedom fighters, did these protesters want quotas for the grandchildren of Razakers? Essentially, she labeled the student protesters as pro-Razakers.
In context, Razakers were those who aided the Pakistan army during the 1971 Liberation War, marking student protesters with the highest level of anti-national tag. Razaker is such a powerful word in Bangladesh, akin to mixing terms like Tuk Tuk Gang, Khan Market Gang, Saros Gang, Libtards, Secular Traders, Anti-Nationals in India, creating a superlative, Razaker. This insult hurt and angered students, intensifying the protests. Students started chanting, one, two, three, four, we are all Razakers. Who are we? We are Razakers. Who said it? Who said it? Autocrat? Autocrat. Suchi? Name calling and targeting are a part of the dictator's toolkit to delegitimize protesters by calling them traitors and demotivating them. The very next day, on July 15th, attacks began. The General Secretary of Awami League said that the Bangladesh Katra League, the student wing of Awami League, could give a stern response to the protesters. Reports indicate that some goons from the Awami League's student body started attacking protesting students, with some reports of gun usage. On July 16th, six protesters lost their lives, but students did not back down. Large-scale rallies and showdowns began. Sheikh Hasina's police started baton charging. On July 18th, reports indicated that at Brack University in Dhaka, inside and outside the campus, police used batons, tear gas, and in some cases, bullets. By July 18th, 30th protesters had died at the hands of the police. Protesters also attacked some government offices. At this point, Sheikh Hasina should have taken clear action to restore peace, possibly forming a committee and issuing strong orders to the police to refrain from using deadly violence against protesters. The Awami League Student Union could have been controlled as well. Protesters' legitimate demands should not have been suppressed with violence, but dictators often see themselves as infallible, acting according to their own beliefs. Sheikh Hasina employed her dictatorial digital toolkit, imposing an internet shutdown across the country overnight on July 18, and complete curfews in cities were also enforced. On July 19, army troops were deployed. The exact number of deaths and injuries is unknown due to an information blackout as of the recording of this episode. Ground reports suggest at least 163 deaths and 25,000 injuries, with the death toll potentially higher. Despite all this, Sheikh Hasina had to yield somewhat to student demands. The Supreme Court's hearing, initially set for August 7th, was preponed to July 21st. The Supreme Court's appellate bench modified the quota system, reducing it from 56% to 7%, including 5% for freedom fighters' descendants, 1% for ethnic minorities, and 1% for disabled and transgender people. Even the dictator and those in power, including Hasina, had to bow to student power. However, the protests have not ended, and the crisis is not over. Students demand the immediate release of hundreds of arrested protesters, and the resignation of officials responsible for the deaths. Additionally, groups wish to continue the movement as a pro-democracy movement until Sheikh Hasina resigns. Students have suspended their protest for two days as of the recording of this episode. Remember, the internet is still suspended in Bangladesh, so Sheikh Hasina might still play more tricks. There is talk that the protests will continue until the government forms a commission to create a representative quota system. Whether this will happen or if Sheikh Hasina will attempt to exert her will through the back door remains to be seen. Will any action be taken against the violent Awami League student union and police? This remains to be seen. We are not overly optimistic. But one thing is clear, no matter how powerful a dictator believes they are, they must bow before the power of the people, especially student power. These are the same students who led the language movement from 1948 to 1952, fighting for Bangla's equality with Urdu in undivided Pakistan. When Pakistan didn't listen, they played a significant role in the 1971 Liberation War. Students were crucial in the 1991 anti-military rule and pro-democracy movement in Bangladesh. Today, students are fighting not just for quota reform but also for democracy in Bangladesh. Bangladesh. They know that Sheikh Hasina's undemocratic policies are sinking the economy, increasing unemployment and inflation. Some in India argue that protests against reservations in Bangladesh should inspire similar protests in India, and quotas should be removed. This is a complete misunderstanding of the situation in Bangladesh, as the 30% freedom fighter quota was not based on any social justice principle. However, Indian students can certainly learn from Bangladeshi youth that they should not bow down to dictatorial attitudes against student protests. Sheikh Hasina may control bureaucracy, judiciary, and the election commission, may unleash police brutality, may label protesters as anti-nationals, but ultimately, dictatorship will not prevail.